If you want to build a career hacking modern applications, then you absolutely need to know how they're made. Whether you're doing bounties or pen testing, understanding these three things are going to make you a much better bug hunter. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to NetTech Explain, and in this video, we're going to be talking about how modern applications are developed so that you can better understand and exploit them. And if you stick to the end of this video, I'm going to give you a homework assignment that is guaranteed to level up your skills. So let's get started. The first one we're going to cover is the three-tiered application architecture. Now, even if you haven't heard of this before, you're probably already familiar with some of the underlying ideas. You may have heard of client side or server side where cross-site scripting is a client side vulnerability and SSRF is a server side vulnerability. The way the three tiered application architecture works is it takes a larger application and splits it up into, well, three tiers. So we start with our presentation tier. This is going to be the way that users interact with the application. The presentation tier is going to communicate with the logic tier, and this is typically our backend server code. And then of course, that's going to communicate with the data tier, which is going to have our database and any other blob storage that we have on the back end. Now, there's a lot of benefits to the three tiered architecture, but the one that we're interested in is the interconnectivity between these pieces. So here's an example. Say we want to pen test Slack. If you're familiar, Slack has a mobile version, a desktop version, and a web application version. Now, these are going to be our presentation tier. So this is how the users are going to interact with Slack. All three of these are also going to communicate with the same backend API and, of course, the same backend database and data storage. There's a few things that we can do from here. So the first thing would be that we test each client side application for unique client side vulnerabilities. So for instance, we can test for cross-site scripting and CSRF on the web application version of the client application, or we can test for Android or iOS vulnerabilities on the mobile application. The next thing that we can do is look to see how each of the different client side applications interact with the API to get a more complete view of the logic tier and of course of the data tier as well. And then the third thing is we can test to see if each client application interacts with the API in maybe a unique way, something that the other two or other however many applications don't necessarily share. Okay, story time. I was doing an assessment for a client where they only had an iOS application and a macOS desktop application. Now, at first, it seemed like the applications were pretty strong, but after digging a little deeper, I noticed that the mobile application made calls to the API in a pretty unique way. It was sending serialized information, but the mobile application didn't require that the serialized data was signed like the desktop application did. So what I did was upload a malicious serialized payload through the mobile applications API to the backend server, and then I downloaded it with the desktop application. Now the desktop was running Java, and of course it had one of the vulnerable gadgets that you'll find in Why So Serial. And all of this together led me to remote code execution on the desktop application because of that interconnectivity piece. So that's the three-tiered application architecture. Next, the second thing we're going to look at is what is called MVC framework. And the way that it works is pretty interesting. It stands for model, view, and controller. So the model is going to be our backend server logic. The view is going to be what's presented to the users and how users interact with the application. And then the controller is going to route between the two. Now, MVC framework is something that can be a little confusing for beginners at first. Like for instance, if you Google MVC framework, you're going to be hit with a lot of jargon and things that can be just a little overwhelming to understand. So instead, I'm going to give you the easiest analogy, and that is going to a restaurant. In this case, our view is going to be our table. Our model is going to be our chefs in the back that prepare our food. And then the controller is going to be the waiter routing between our table and the chefs. So the way this works is I go and sit down to a restaurant and on the restaurant table is a menu. So if you go to example.com, you're going to see a menu that says, here's our homepage, here's our about page, and maybe even a login page. So I'm going to tell the waiter, Hey, I would like to see the login page. What kind of information can you prepare for me from that? 
So the waiter is going to take that information, bring it back to the chefs and then say, Hey, there's a user who's asking for the login page. I need you to cook up something real quick. And I'm going to bring that back over to them. So the chefs cook that up, they give it to the waiter, the waiter puts it back on the table. And that's how I interact with the application. So now I want to log into the application. So I'm going to ask for a custom order. Here's my username and password. And I want a custom session token off of that based on uh, my information. So we're going to hand that to the waiter, waiter hands that to the chef. They do their backend processing, something that the user and the view doesn't see. They hand that back to the waiter. The, hand, the waiter hands it back to the user on their table, which is again, their view. So if we successfully logged into example.com, we're going to get a new session token and we're going to be routed to a new web page. So that's MVC in a nutshell. Okay. The third thing we're going to look at is how all of this comes together in code. Now, if MVC framework and the three tier architecture sound a little similar, that's because these are both called abstractions. What abstractions are is it is a way to take a larger application and break it up into smaller pieces that interconnect between each other. This is great for a lot of reasons, but again, this is something that is going to help us understand how modern applications are built. So let's take a look at code and we're going to do that right now. So what we're taking a look at is the tornado web blog. Uh, it's one of the demos in their tornado web. What's great about this is that it shows you how to build a CRUD application using Tornado. Now, it doesn't have to be Tornado, it could be Django, it could be Node.js or anything else, but the idea is this model view controller framework. So let's go ahead and open up the blog.py. Everything we need is in this file. And the first thing you wanna take a look at whenever you're doing a code review is the routes. Sometimes like on Ruby on Rails, this is a routes file, but this is gonna be the controller. So if I go to example.com slash login, it's gonna tell me where that part of the application logic is stored. So here, I'm just going to scroll down a little bit and I see this um, class application. We can see if I go to example.com slash, which is just kind of the home page, it's handled by the home handler. But what I'm looking for is this auth slash login, which is handled by the login handler. Now I can just go ahead and jump to the class. This is the application logic that handles the login. Now, if you're familiar with HTTP, some of these words should look a little familiar. When you go to example.com slash auth slash login and you hit enter, you send what is called a get request. And that get request is handled by this async def get. And then when you enter in your username and password and you hit enter, that sends what is called a post request. And that is handled by this async def post. Now for CRUD, we wanna be able to update and delete things as well. So put and delete would be very similar if we came across those. So the first thing we do, we go to example.com slash auth slash login. And the application logic here says, if this is the first time running the application, then don't do anything. Um, or actually send the user to create a new user account. So that's gonna redirect us to slash auth slash create, and then we're gonna be able to create a user account. However, if a user account already exists, say an admin account, or maybe it's just our, our first blog user, then it's gonna go ahead and render that login.html page, which is awesome. So we go ahead and enter in our username and our password. We hit enter and that sends off this post request. And here's where we get the post logic. So we all know how a login page works, right? You enter username and password. If the username matches and if the password matches, then you get logged in. So here's what the application logic looks like. So the first thing that it tries to do is select star from authors where the email equals the user's email address. Uh, so that's going to be our username. Now, if that does not exist, then it's gonna throw an error and it's gonna re-render that login HTML page, but it's gonna put a little red text above the login page saying email not found. Uh, the next thing that it's gonna do is say that we do have a valid username or a valid email address, then it's going to check the passwords and it's gonna see if the passwords are equal. So here we can see that it's using some tornado logic in order to do a check on the bcrypt password. Remember passwords you should never store in plain text. So in this case, it's hashed using bcrypt. So it's going to take the password that we submitted and it's going to take the password that's stored in the database. We see this author.hashed password, and then it's going to bcrypt uh, our, use our password. The other one's already bcrypted, and then it's going to compare the two. And if they match, then it's going to go ahead and uh, go to the next bit. So if password equal, then it's going to set the signed cookie blog demo user, and it's going to use the author ID. 
and then it's gonna redirect us back to the home page. So we're gonna have an authentication cookie and we're gonna be sent back to example.com. If they don't match, then it's gonna re-render that login.html page and it's gonna have a little piece of red text that says incorrect password. And that's it. That's all of the application logic behind logging into this blog example. So we took a look at the view, which is gonna be this login.html page. Uh, we took a look at the controller, which was that routes file up above. And then this is the model or the application logic behind it. Oftentimes these are called handlers as well. Awesome. Well, like I said in the beginning of the video, I'm gonna give you a homework assignment that is guaranteed to level up your skills. So what I'm gonna have you do is add one piece of CRUD functionality to the application code that we just took a look at. Now, CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. In HTTP terms, this is usually Get, Put, Post, and Delete as our four HTTP verbs. So this doesn't have to be big, but it does have to be significant. Usually what I have people do is add a photo gallery. So something where a user can log in and upload photos, update descriptions, delete photos that they don't want there anymore, and then any unauthenticated user can see the photos in the photo gallery on the website. What this is gonna do for you is get you a little more familiar with code, as well as understanding the MVC framework and how application logic works on the backend. I don't want you to spend too much time on the HTML part. In fact, you should use any sort of HTML that you can find for a web gallery on W3Schools or GitHub, but you're gonna have to write the backend code yourself. With a challenge like this, it's gonna be a bit of a struggle, and that's kind of the point. But if it's too difficult, I want you to leave me a comment down below and we'll be able to get you started. Well, that's all I have for you today. For more information, check out the links in the description below. And if you like this video, do all the YouTube things, right? Give me a thumbs up or hit that subscribe button. And if you learned something today, I wanna to hear from you in the comments down below as well. With that, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.